Thank you for the opportunity of appearing here. And I might mention that though I've traveled far, it's not to get meat. So, <laughs> <laughs> we, the opposition, accept, accept that gender can be used to discriminate and occasionally make adverse considerations profitable and apparently legal and appropriate. And even occasionally, gender may oppress. We do not, however, accept that that's the purpose of gender. It's not the purpose to oppress, and it's not a social construct. We hold gender exists to reflect the reality that individuals manifest sex-associated characteristics of self that are inherent in social manifestations of biological processes. These can be in accordance with or discordant from the general anatomy or other physical appearances or any other aspect of one's life. But they are inherent due to a process we call biased interaction. We think that the house's motion idea is wrong prima facie. I will illustrate this with three specific examples of gender being inherent and biologically induced and will have nothing to do with social constructs. The first example goes by the name, the pseudonym of John Joan. This individual was one of a set of identical normal male twins. Sent to circumcision as an infant, his penis was burnt off due to some accident. These anguished parents were trying to decide what to do. They sought assistance from physicians near and wide. When they got to one particular psychologist, John Money at the Johns Hopkins University, they were told that a, pa a male without a penis cannot exist, wouldn't be able to cope with society best thing is to raise him as a girl. Never tell him of his history, never allow him to doubt, and bring him up as best you can to be a mature woman. The parents accepted this. They wanted to do the best they could for their son. They then decided to raise him and call him Brenda. Castration, and a female vulva was performed on him surgically. The idea was to prepare a vagina for him when he reached puberty, when she reached puberty. David's treatment. I use, we call him Jan Joan when his privacy uh, was needed. When he came out, to write the book that was associated with his name. He admitted that his name was David. He picked the name, by the way, because he figured that he had fought the world and succeeded. He was given psychotherapy regularly to reinforce a female identity, femininity as a girl. He was given estrogens, female hormones, from the age of eight to continue and develop as a puberty, uh, as a woman. Breast development, hip development, all these other body modifications brought on by the endocrines did their job. Despite all of this, at the age of 14, David threatened suicide unless he was able to live as a boy. His life as a girl was unbearable. <coughs> Then he was told of his history, and immediately, not after a long pause, but immediately turned to live as a male. 
And he always felt relief because he said he knew he wasn't a girl. When I met him finally at the age of 25, his age of 25, he immediately uh, realized for the first time that his life was being set up as an example, which he didn't expect. Because he was now married as a male and had adopted his wife's three children. When I asked him how he knew he was a male instead of the female he was being brought up as, he, as all children, compare themselves with others as they develop. They know when they interact whether they are different or the same from others. So in their brain, they don't necessarily have a template of what is a male or what is a female, but they can tell if they are the same or different of others they're being compared with. And David said his social interactions and life experiences told him that when he was trying to act as he normally felt, inherently felt, that when he was with girls, they said, you don't think like we do. <laughs> Your actions are different. And when he was boys, was, when he was with boys, they said, why are you dressing as a girl? You're more like us. So it was his bias internally, which was meeting with the world's interaction that told him whether he was appropriate or not. And he felt, after he could understand what he was interacting with, that he should be more like a boy across the street than the girls his parents were calling him. David's brain, like everyone else's, had been pre-programmed to be able to comprehend same or difference. And he knew who he was like and who he was not like. And that's the heart of a biased interaction theory. Now I'd like to use a second experiment, not a second experience. This is, comes from an indi individual that we call by the professional name of MZA, <coughs> monozygotic twins that are lived apart. Now here is an individual that I met in Australia, and he told me that he was born with a twin, another twin male, but they were separated at birth. He would live with the mother and the parents which got divorced, the other brother would live with the father. And they lived apart, never met each other until the age of 15, but the mother for some reason thought, well, she ought to know, her son ought to know they had a twin brother somewhere in the world. And then they, after they met, they never met again until they were adults. So these were male twins separated at birth, one living with the mother, one living with the father. Yet each had individually followed their internal biases that told them from their real life experiences that life would be better for them, meaning more consistent and easier and, easier and more appropriate to live as women than as men. So both of these individuals, never knowing of the brother, decided to live as women. They were reacting to internal forces which told them which gender they ought to behave as. Yes? Um, how do you account for people born with an intersex condition? Where do they fall into these categories? Or maybe it's, it, it Many of those individuals, yes. Also, uh, when they're reared, they are, in the vast majority of cases, are seen to have the same sex if they're actually reared with almost another they're birth. There are many, division, many reasons people don't make the transition they would like to. <laughs> they would lose their spouse, they would lose their children, they would lose their religion. So there are many social reasons that people are 
forced to continue as they live. But too many of those intersex individuals, which I've written about in many cases, do accept and change. To the, put the best example of that in those born with a condition called cloacal extrophy. These children are born without a genital expression, really. So the best the surgeons can do is say, we'll construct a genitalia for you. Now, which genitalia do you think they would construct? Well, it's easier as the expression goes, pardon my expression, not mine. It's easier to dig a hole than build a pole. <laughs> so what they do is make these individuals into little girls. And the majority of them, when they reach puberty, say, I ain't a girl. I have to live as a boy. So those, those children make that decision. So anyway, that's the second type of individual. Born, born together, lived apart, and when they come together, when they live their life, individually they made the same decision. That came from some internal voice. A third thing I'll just talk about I, in my limited time left is a, big, a bigger study of transsexuals. We have over a hundred set of twins in which one or both made the transition to live in the opposite gender. Again, listening to some internal voice. But if they were identical twins, they made this choice about 40% of the time where both will make the transition. If they were dizygotic, they didn't make that choice. So it only happened in identical twins for the males and about 25% for the females, which definitely shows the biological input to that uh, trait. So in conclusion, oh, I might mention a fourth re a reason to show its implication is that these transsexual children usually make this announcement to their parents before the age of five. Now it's not because they've been opposed with any particular feature, but how do you think their parents react? Well, for the little boy who says, I want to be a little girl, they give him a soccer ball and say, go play boys games, but they don't do that. That little boy pirouettes out of the house and wants to live as a girl, and vice versa. For the girl who wants to live as a boy, she refuses to wear a dress at school and goes to school and lives that life. So in conclusion, what I would say is, Gender is not a social construct. It is a reaction to the individual's individual self expressing itself by knowing when someone is same or different. And that individual begins to associate with the individual gender that is the same. Thank you very much.